Good morning. Welcome you to our annual Windows commemoration of the life and work of Dr. King. Um, you'll remember that Paul wrote in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, all are one in Jesus Christ. And what Dr. King understood, basically what Paul said, is that there's something about the gospel uh, within which breaking down dividing walls that separate individuals and groups, that that's a fundamental part of what it is to be a Christian, a Christian and to apply the gospel to our world. And Dr. King, of course, very much understood that. As we try to apply these lessons to our life, we're grateful to have with us today Dr. Clarence Lusane uh, to share with us a presentation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him before he comes up to talk to you. Dr. Lusane is Associate Professor of Political Science in the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, D.C. He teaches and researches international human rights, comparative race relations, social movements, and electoral politics. He's best described, I'd say, if you sort of look at his profile, uh, not merely as a speaker, an author, but as an activist, a scholar, a lecturer, and a journalist. For more than 30 years, although you don't look like it, uh, he's written about and been active in national and international anti-racism, politics, globalization, U.S. foreign policy, human rights, and social issues such as education and drug policy. Dr. Lusain has been a political and technical consultant uh, with the World Council of Churches, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and to a number of elected officials and nonprofit organizations. He's a frequent guest on C-SPAN, on PBS, on BET, and other national and international news and television radio programs. He's written eight books, most recently the very interesting uh, t title, The Black History of the White House. In addition to his books, he's written many articles, including his 1983 article, Israeli Arms to Central America, which won the prestigious Project Censored Investigative Reporting Award as the most censored article of the year. We're grateful that he can be with us to commemorate the work of Dr. King in a presentation entitled, King, Obama, and the Ark of Justice. Let's welcome Dr. Lusain. Do you have something first? Ah, and before that, we have one announcement. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to present the Howard Thurman Award, so I'm going to tell you a little about him, and then I'm going to present the award to the recipient. The Howard Thurman Award is presented to a staff or faculty member who has embodied the same spirit and commitment to diversity as Dr. Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was born and raised in Daytona, Florida by his grandmother, who had been enslaved. In 1925, he became an ordained Baptist minister. His first pastorate in Mount Zion Baptist Church in Ohio was followed by a joint appointment as professor of religion and director of religious life at Morehouse and Spelman Colleges in Georgia. Thurman spent the spring semester of 1929 studying in Haverford College with Rufus Jones, a Quaker mystic and leader of the Pacifist Interracial Fellowship of Reconciliation. Here he began his journey towards a philosophy that stressed an activism rooted in faith, guided by spirit, and maintained in peace. Thurman was selected as the first dean of Rankin Chapel at Howard University in the District of Columbia in 1932. He served there from 1932 to 1944. He also served on the faculty of Howard University of School of Divinity. Thurman traveled broadly, heading Christian missions and meeting with world figures such as Gandhi. In 1944, Thurman left his tenured position at Howard to help the Fellowship of Reconciliation establish the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco, California. It was the first racially integrated intercultural church in the United States. He served as co-pastor with a white minister, Dr. Alfred Fisk. Dr. Thurman was then invited to Boston University in 1958, where he became the first black dean of March Chapel. He was the first black person to be named tenured dean of chapel at a majority white university. In addition, he served on the faculty of Boston University's School of Theology. Thurman was also active and well-known in the Boston community where he influenced many leaders. 
After leaving Marsh Chapel in 1965, Thurman continued his ministry as chairman of the board and director of the Howard Thurman Educational Trust in San Francisco until his death in 1981. Recipients of this award are selected by student leaders in MAC. Past award recipients include Dr. David Black, Betty Ann Brigham, Daryl Hawkins, Elvira and Eduardo Ramirez, and Kathy Couts. This year re recipient is Ms. Letaria Scott. <laughs> Come on down. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. First, let me give my thanks to uh, Eastern University for inviting me. Uh, I'd love to travel around the country and talk to uh, people and have exchanges of ideas, exchanges of information. So it really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, the provost office has been absolutely great uh, in organizing this. And particularly, I want to thank uh, Ms. Nancy Hartstock. Uh, she was on email to me every day, making sure that every detail of the logistics, every detail of the program uh, was really clear and was really laid out well. So, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hartsock. And, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, once I was in Alabama giving a talk and I was sitting next to my grandmother and someone was giving this long, long, long introduction. And I was sitting there feeling all proud. And my grandmother turns to me and says, sounds like you can't keep a job. So <laughs> she wasn't all that impressed. She was like, you probably need to focus a little more. <laughs> you know, don't try to do too much. <laughs> uh, I'm really grateful that you guys do this program. Uh, as Nancy was telling me, uh, you do it every year. And it's really important uh, to frame King not only by what he did domestically. I think that both Martin Luther King and Barack Obama really do, in the words of Langston Hughes, want to be seen as Americans, want to see the country move forward. But both King and, and uh, President Obama also saw themselves as part of the global community. One of King's most important speech, which is generally known as the World House speech, he states, however deeply American Negroes are caught in the struggle to be at last at home in our homeland of the United States, we cannot ignore the larger World House in which we are also dwellers. So I think it's really important for scholars of Martin Luther King to not only see his, uh, global, his local dimensions, but also his uh, global dimensions. One of the books I'm working on right now is to look at the 2008 Obama campaign and subsequent elections impact on global discourses around race. Because all around the world, people were responding to uh, the possibility of an African American becoming president of the United States, from the Czech Republic to, to, um, to Japan, to Botswana, to the UK, all over the world, uh, people were responding. And there hasn't been as much written about that as, as it should be, uh, so that's one of the works that I'm doing. Uh, there are going to be three points of discussion that I'm going to go through, uh, hopefully briefly, uh, in this presentation. One, looking at the legacies of King and Obama. How should we think about these individuals as we project, uh, particularly with President Obama, in the future? Secondly, what should be the relationship between the progressive movement and the president? Right? What kind of uh, symmetry, what kind of uh, synchronization uh, should happen as uh, possible? And then talk a little bit about the unfinished agenda, not only of Martin Luther King, but the unfinished agenda of President Obama. Let me begin by telling you some history you may not know. In 1968, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was elected president of the United States. 
Now, this is according to a film that the Discovery Channel did in 1997. They had a series that was called What If? And they imagined all of these different possibilities of how history may have changed. And one of the series, uh, one of the films was of What If Martin Luther King Had Not Been Assassinated? And as they tell the story, King was not assassinated uh, in April 1968. He survived. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. The Democrats and the progressive movement needed a candidate. King stepped forward, and he was elected president. The King administration pushed through a radical agenda, focused on the things that King talked about, creating more jobs for people, addressing issues of discrimination and racism, more educational opportunities for people, and anti-poverty. King ended the war in Vietnam, which was, of course, the big challenge for the country uh, in that period. Uh, he even recruited black astronauts. And the country had changed so much, this is according to this film, that Barbie even began to have black friends. Barbie the doll. Because in 1967, Barbie lived basically in an all-white world. Uh, and it actually wasn't until 1980 that the first uh, black Barbie appeared. I'm sorry that I even know that information, but uh, in 1980, right, Barbie got with the picture, right, became multicultural and all that, right. Now, the reality was that actually there had been a move for running King for president. In early 1967, uh, after King delivered his speech against the war in Vietnam, there were many people in the progressive movement who said King should run for president and he should run regardless if Robert Kennedy or some of the other uh, liberals in the Democratic Party were running uh, or not. And King said, no, I'm not interested in the least bit in doing this. And so ultimately, there was so much pressure on King from progressive movement, uh, not as much from the black community, but from the progressive movement, that King ultimately had to issue a statement where he says, I have come to think of my role as one which operates outside the realm of partisan politics. I have no interest in a political uh, candidacy. <clears throat> but the question is, how popular was King in 1967? Now, as we think about King now, we have these kinds of events. We have a national holiday named after King. There's a lot of historic revision that has went on. And a lot of the people, some of whom were alive at the time, but many who were not, who were celebrating King would absolutely not have celebrated King during his lifetime. King was very uh, vilified uh, in 1967. Really, the high point of his popularity was 1963, 1964. After that, as he began to turn to economic issues, look at the war on poverty, as he began to turn to international issues, the US role in some of the uh, conflicts that were going on, his popularity died uh, tremendously. And most Americans viewed the civil rights agenda as too radical. This is why it was really critical that President Johnson got behind that agenda, and ultimately he knew, and he was absolutely right, that it was going to cost the Democrats severely. How popular was King? The Gallup organization did a poll in 1967 to see how King would measure up against other people who were going to run for the presidency. And in that period, you had Lyndon Johnson, uh, who was ranking the highest at that point uh, with, uh, with 34% uh, uh, rating. Uh, Lyndon Johnson ultimately decided, for a lot of reasons, that he would not run. Uh, so he was not the candidate for the Democrats in 1968. Uh, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, uh, was actually the leading Republican candidate in 1967. Ultimately, he lost to Richard Nixon, who would actually go on and win. And then uh, George Wallace, who ran on the state's rights uh, platform, which was to uh, completely against the civil rights agenda, actually was polling at 11%. Martin Luther King, 2%, right? People did not want Martin Luther King to run for office. They certainly were not supporting him uh, in this period. So it's really important to have a historic sense of where King was at 
as the civil rights movement was unfolding, and he continued to try to step forward to meet uh, the challenges. But King, of course, had his revenge. And the legacy of King is as we know it today, that King uh, uh, Gallup uh, also did a poll a couple of years ago looking at the most admired woman or man of the 20th century, and King came in second only to uh, Mother Teresa. King came in ahead of Gandhi, came in ahead of Winston Churchill, came in ahead of Nelson Mandela, came in ahead of Theodore, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So King's legacy is very much, uh, uh, in hindsight, if we look at the period when King lived uh, and the challenges he had, he, was, he uh, became very unpopular at, a, some po at a point. But because of what he actually did and from historic hindsight, and we go back and evaluate what was the value of his leadership, the policies that he struggled for, and even up to his last days, what he fought around, then you see the kind of, uh, ultimately, his legacy really is reflective of uh, tremendous accomplishments. Uh, how will President Obama be remembered? Now, there's been a debate recently about whether Obama should be on Mount Rushmore. Now, if you uh, take away the fact that actually the sculptor, the original sculptor was actually a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and you know, that is a bit in conflict with putting uh, Obama up there, plus I'm not sure how he would fit. But in any case, uh, this kind of debate about what will Obama's legacy be uh, is really unfolding now, and the, real the reality is that we don't know. We have no idea 10 years from now, 15 years from now, whether we're gonna think that President Obama was a mediocre president, he was a good president, or he was a great president. Uh, a lot of this actually may not even be in his control because ultimately when we think of great presidents, it's the circumstances under which they were confronted that created the opportunity for greatness. And that doesn't happen with every president. You're, every president isn't challenged with a civil war or with a great depression or with the country coming apart because of racial division. So for all of the ways in which President Obama may be trying to address the issues of the country, they just may not rise up to that level. Or the president may be faced with a, uh, a crisis in the country and blow it, uh, September 11th, right? So how we see Obama in the future, nobody knows. And that's something that we will that we evolve over time. And it's important to know that uh, Martin Luther King did not worry about his legacy. King said that, these are the issues that we have to deal with. One of his famous uh, quotes, of course, is the fierce, fierce urgency of now. And King said, this is what we have to deal with, whether it's popular or not. And I can't worry about how I'm going to be seen in the next decade. I have to worry about the issues that people are being confronted with at this moment. And it seems that, uh, to some degree, President Obama uh, embodies some of that uh, spirit. Now, there are a lot of links between uh, President Obama and uh, Martin Luther King, some symbolic, some more uh, substantive. Certainly there is the fact that King's speech uh, at the March on Washington took place October, August uh, 28, 1963, and Obama accepting the uh, nomination to be president from the Democratic Party took place August 28, 2008. And that 45-year period between that uh, has often been looked at as a period of great transition in the country on a whole lot of different levels. And so you have that just kind of a convergence, uh, almost of an accident, but a convergence that uh, also is a way in which we can sort of look at the relationship between these two. Uh, I think, however, there might be somewhat of a paradox in terms of King's speech at the March on Washington is certainly his most memorable, but not necessarily his most important. And Obama's speech at the DNC, uh, at the Democratic Party accepting the nomination, was probably his most important, but not his most memorable. If we think about King, there's an argument that can be made that the speech he gave exactly one year before he died, the one that's generally referred to as beyond uh, Vietnam, was perhaps his most important, because King said that our agenda is not narrowly focused on just civil rights, but we have a global agenda. We have a broader picture, and that dramatically changed King's relationship to the uh, government, to the political parties, to the progressive movement, to the civil rights movement. There are many in the civil rights movement who did not want King to go there. 
to not talk, did not want him to talk about civil rights. And certainly there were many uh, commentators in the media, there were many in the political movements who said, you don't need to talk about these issues, you need to stay focused. But King said, no, this is the right thing to do. People are dying, there's no justification for this war. We need to make this part of our overall kind of agenda. And then for Obama, uh, certainly the speech he gave at the uh, 2004 uh, DNC was the speech that launched him uh, to the American public and ultimately led to him uh, becoming president. There's also, of course, the convergence that you have the first African-American president who dedicates the National King Memorial uh, in Washington, D.C. This happened in part because it took decades for this thing to actually get built. So even though it was proposed uh, nearly 30 years ago, it took forever and ever and ever and ever for it to actually uh, come about. And then it comes about when the first African-American president uh, actually is, is on the radar. Now, the dedication, the memorial has 14 uh, quotes from uh, Martin Luther King. And there's been a bit of a controversy because one of the quotes was actually put up incorrectly in terms of what King actually said and how the quote uh, was put up and that had to be corrected. Uh, but there's another quote on it that also is a bit, uh, bit of a problem uh, or a bit uh, historically not totally accurate. Uh, Martin, uh, President Obama will often say the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. And he likes this quote so much that in the rug that's in President Obama's office, uh, he had a new rug put in, and along the edge of the rug, there are quotes. There are quotes from Thomas Jefferson, from John F. Kennedy, from Franklin Roosevelt, from Abraham Lincoln. The only non-quote from, the only quote from a non-president uh, is this quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, which he attributes to Martin Luther King. Well, as it turns out, the quote, the quote actually was originally from uh, Reverend Theodore Parker, who was a radical abolitionist in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, uh, who at one point in 1853 said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one, but from where I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Now, King did, actually, did, King did not steal his quote. Uh, he often said, which is missing often in people's references, uh, that the quote did come from Reverend Parker. So he does attribute the, the history of the quote uh, appropriately, but as sometimes happens, uh, lost in kind of the muddle, uh, the attribution to it often is given to King and even President Obama uh, and the rug on his office floor uh, have gotten that little problem wrong. Now, Reverend Parker actually was a very uh, interesting and uh, radical character. He actually died in, before Lincoln became president, right before Lincoln became president. So we don't know his thoughts on Lincoln. But he gave many speeches. He was really a popular orator. Uh, president Obama's actually not the, wrong, the first person to, uh, the first president to get his words uh, and not give him attribute. Uh, actually, Lincoln did the same thing. We all know Lincoln's uh, famous closing at the Gettysburg Address uh, in 1863. This 150 year anniversary here this, this year. Uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. In 1850, Parker gave a talk and he said, a democracy, that is a government of all the people, by all the people, for all the people. So it's important that we do our historic research. Uh, certainly, if Lincoln and President Obama can't get it right, sometimes the rest of us can't either. But it's really important that we attribute uh, as much as we understand and can follow uh, where these really uh, important uh, ideas come from. Now, again, the ideas themselves are important, and so that's really what's uh, critical here. Now, there are a lot of similarities between uh, King and Obama. Uh, both are brilliant orators. Uh, King, uh, as we know, speech after speech after speech, uh, mobilized millions of people around the country, and indeed millions of people around the world. I taught a class many years ago and I often would have, it was a class on cross-cultural communication, and I would often have students uh, talk about how they were influenced by certain forms of communication. And at one point I had a student stand up who was from Taiwan, 
And he got up and he started talking and he says, well, you know, I was really influenced uh, but by Dr. King, but before I tell you that, let me tell you what happened. And he starts talking about how at one point he was pressed into the military. He had no choice. He had to serve. And they put him in the part of the military that carried out executions. So he starts telling this story. The room gets really quiet. Chairs start backing up, right? Because people are like, where is he going with this? Right. And so he's telling this story of how horrible it was. He had no choice. He was the person that gave the final command for someone to be executed. Really traumatized him, he said. And he, you know, served out his term, uh, but he was really kind of very damaged by this. But at one point, he found some speeches of Martin Luther King. And he read these speeches, he read Kings talking about forgiveness, Kings talking about peace, and he said it really helped him get through. He decided what he was gonna do. There were, I think about 20 people or so that he oversaw their executions, tracked down the families of each of those individuals and went and personally apologized, right? But this was because he read Martin Luther King. So King's words really truly have had an impact uh, globally. Uh, and in, in to a great degree, uh, President Obama. Certainly we remember when he ran in 2008, the speeches he gave around the world, particularly in Germany, where over 200,000 people came out. Right? This was the largest crowd in Germany to come out for a speech since the days of Hitler. Right? So Obama's impact, which is basically at that point were his words, really show that you know they're the power of oratory and that in that sense these two are very much alike uh, president obama as well as dr king also project uh empathy much of i think what happened in 2012 in the presidential election was not because president obama's policies were uh, seen by many people as working. People were hoping they would work, and there was a sense that maybe they are going to start work. But it really boiled down to, and the polls show this, that people felt President Obama felt their issues more than the other side. And that really is a powerful kind of way that, and you really can't fake that. Either you have it, either you exhibit it, or you really kind of don't. You can try to fake it, but that doesn't really kind of fly. Uh, they also both studied uh, intellects. He really is Dr. Martin Luther King. He, can, he worked uh, uh, on a dissertation, his dissertation in theology, uh, and really what wrote his own material uh, to a great degree. So when he published books, these were books that weren't ghostwritten. These were books where King had to find the time, sit down, and just really kind of hammer them out. And he didn't have a computer. He didn't have access to Google. You know, he really had to do the kind of, you know, hard writing that people did uh, before these modern technologies. And so is uh, President Obama uh, in many ways. And uh, lastly, was a similarity I think that's important is that they both understand race. Neither have, uh, neither ran away from the issue, but they also see beyond race. And this is often a challenge for people who support both King and both uh, President Obama to see that they're not just locked into addressing what are still ongoing, persistent uh, issues of racial discrimination, but that there's much more going on beyond that and that all of that has to be put into the mix. Uh, but there are also some important differences. Uh, differences. Different constituencies. Uh, President Obama's constituency is the American people that elected him. And he has to address all these conflicting uh, constituencies that are under his, uh, um, under his presidency. Where Martin Luther King was very clear, his constituency was to try to mobilize people who really wanted social justice. He wasn't trying to mobilize conservatives. He wasn't trying to mobilize the far right. As a minister, as a man of God, as someone who saw uh, the humanity in everyone, he, of course, said, everybody, we're all in this together. But his constituency specifically were the uh, foot soldiers of social justice. Uh, they also have different strategies. King's strategy was disrupt the system. If the system is not working, then you have to change the system. You have to get and put yourself in a position where you shut the system down in a nonviolent kind of way. President Obama is the system, 
Right. So President Obama very much has to make sure that he keeps this system somewhat balanced and reforms it where it needs reform it in a way that isn't destabilizing because the consequences are very different. Uh, in terms of power, it's often said that the presidency of the United States is the most powerful political position in the world. And to a great degree, that's true. But there are also major constraints on the president that Martin Luther King, people in the progressive movement, other folks do not have. People are outside of political office. Virtually every single word that comes out of President Obama's mouth has a political impact, has an economic impact, has an ideological impact, has a cultural impact. And he's absolutely aware of this. The administration is aware of this. All of his team is aware of this. So he understands there are things he can say and things he cannot say. Uh, and in fact, in the first uh, six months or so of his presidency, he found this out. Because President Obama, when he was Senator Obama actually, uh, was a very direct kind of guy. Uh, he's like, actually, he's very uh, down to earth kind of guy. And in more relaxed circumstances, he pretty much speaks like the rest of us, right? And so he would often just say things kind of off the cuff, which many of us would say, but doesn't have any impact. But we remember the situation in Boston, for example, when Pre Professor Henry Louis Gates was arrested uh, trying to get into his house, and Obama sort of said, you know, that was kind of stupid. Why didn't they just let the man in his house? And it created a firestorm. And the administration was shocked. They could not believe that there was this kind of reaction but they learned their lesson. Every single thing that President Obama says has consequences. And so there are constraints on the president. And then also different times. In the 1960s, when King was around, when Barbie didn't have black friends, you know, it was a very different kind of environment to try to bring about social change. There were very few uh, black elected officials, very few progressive and liberal elected officials. The political base in the country and strength in the country in many ways was in the hand of Southern Dixiecrats who headed up most of the key committees in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. It was a very different kind of uh, uh, deal than what we're facing right now. So, this is important because the question is who sets the agenda for the progressive movement? And that agenda needs to be set by the progressive movement. Uh, there's been a lot of debate and there were expectations that President Obama would come in, that he would uh, advocate for a broad kind of progressive agenda, fight with Congress, and things would kind of move forward. But the reality is that the President of the United States, regardless of who it is, should not be, cannot be, is not the leader of the progressive movement. That has to be organic, that has to come from below. And we can see the power of that. One of the key uh, uh, experiences that really shaped the 2012 elections was the Occupy movement. The movement that says, we are the 99% the 1% is uh, destroying the country, and we have to challenge that. That did not come from President Obama. We have never come from President Obama or any other president. This is the kind of movement that has to grow up organically in order to push the country in ways in which it may not want to be pushed but needs to go. And so that is a really kind of critical, important uh, difference. So. What should be some of the elements of a progressive agenda versus the agenda that President Obama uh, has articulated? There are a number of issues that have not come up uh, or have only been given very, very brief kinds of mention by the administration, but absolutely should be central to changing the country and moving it uh, in a progressive direction. Political reform. When President Obama spoke uh, after he won the 2012 election, he mentioned briefly that he really was upset about the long lines and the problems that he saw with last year's election. Uh, maybe we should do something about it. People have been in the progressive movement have been talking about this for years. Employment and a living wage. These are issues that should be addressed. The eradication of poverty uh, has often been noted. Very, very little has been mentioned about poverty. Uh, educational opportunities, criminal justice reform, immigration, but immigration in a particular way, and then global peace and justice. It's really critical uh, when we talk about political reform 
because ultimately, public policy is the resolution of the tension between the progressive uh, agenda and the ideas that people want and how it actually starts to impact people's lives. And so it's really critical that the political system is one that's open, one that's fair, and one that's inclusive. And what we have as a political system right now is dysfunctional at all, virtually every single level. And this is really kind of remarkable uh, given the promotion of democracy uh, by the U.S. around the world, which it should do, but there are democratic, unresolved democratic issues here in the United States. Uh, part of what this is, comes out of is a long history of states' rights and giving states the kind of authority that really should be, if we have a federal system, we have a national government, really should be national, virtually like every other country in the world. No other country has a system where various jurisdictions and various states basically set their own rules about elections. When people can register to vote, what the requirements are for registering to vote, the times that people can vote, all those things that are set by states really should be national policy. There should be universal national registration that says everybody turns 18 is automatically registered. We'll figure out how to ID people and all that, but we should not leave registration up to private organizations or the political parties, which is basically what we've done. We're seeing other challenges to the, the electoral college system itself, of course, needs to be overthrown. Uh, it wasn't just the 2000 election when Al Gore, who won the popular vote by about 500,000 votes, was denied the presidency because of the quirkiness of the uh, U.S. Uh, Constitution Electoral College, but there have been four other elections in U.S. history where, in effect, the same thing has happened. The Electoral College system does not exist anywhere else on the planet. It may exist on Mars or some other places we don't know, but does not exist anywhere else on, the, on, uh, on Earth because it is a fundamentally unfair uh, structure. So that needs to be overthrown. Uh, and what we're seeing are attacks on voting rights, the things that King fought for that ultimately ended up in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 are being fundamentally challenged at this point. Uh, we saw in the last couple of years uh, dozens of uh, anti-voting and voting suppression kinds of policies that were proposed, some of which were implemented, many of which were challenged, but are still going through the courts. Even now we're starting to see uh, plans by, the, frankly, the Republican Party to change the rules on how electoral college votes are counted. And this is because given the 2010 census redistricting that created districts that solidify Republican domination in states like Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, states where the Democrats won overwhelmingly the majority of votes in those states, but have lost the majority of congressional districts in those states. Their, their efforts to create circumstances where if the policies that are being proposed right now are put in place, in last year's election, if President Obama and Mitt Romney got the same exact amount of votes, Mitt Romney would be the president, right? These are the kind of changes that are being proposed uh, even as we uh, sit here. Of course, there needs to be uh, a focus on job creation. President Obama has said he wants to do this. In fact, he's proposed a jobs bill that is virtually nowhere in Congress, and it's difficult to see, given the configuration of Congress, uh, that it will go anywhere uh, over this year or the next couple of years. But it's very urgent that there is a federal role in the process of government of, of job creation, particularly for communities that are simply not going to uh, move forward even as the economy recovers. There needs to be specific and targeting kinds of uh, job creation. For example, for African Americans, the reason why even as the overall unemployment rate has been dropping across the country, and it has. It was a high of 10, now it's like 7%. But for the African-American community, not only has it stayed high in some instances, even in a month where the overall job creation or unemployment fell, the unemployment among African-Americans increased. The reason for that 
is because African Americans are disproportionately in public sector jobs. And although private sector jobs are being created and the economy is recovering in that arena, in many places across the country, particularly states that are controlled by Republicans, there have been a massive assault on cutting jobs. And in state after state after state, the elimination of these public sector jobs is having a disproportionate impact on African-American employment. So there's very specific targeting in, in President Obama, uh, Obama's jobs uh, legislation really does target uh, that particular problem. Uh, there is a way in which we also need to think about jobs in a global kind of context, not just in terms uh, of the United States. I'm going to move through this uh, a bit quickly to get towards the end. Now, what's really was important about King is that he helped us reimagine race relations in the country. King, again, going back to the quote from uh, Langston Hughes, said, we are Americans. We're not asking for anything more, but we don't want to accept anything less. The country is changed. We have been part of this country since its history. We need to be fully included in it. And King, beyond his activism, had an impact on our imagination and what the country should be, what the country could become. President Obama helped us reimagine the presidency. Presidency up until Obama was elected, more or less looked like these guys, right? President Obama said, well, no, you know, maybe we can change that a little bit. Maybe things can look a bit different. But he was also very clear that one election of an African American was not going to change the fundamental dynamics and processes and relationships of race in the country. He said it once, he said it before, I have never been so naive as to believe that we can get beyond our racial divisions in a single election, a single cycle, or with a single candidacy, uh, particularly a candidacy as imperfect uh, as my own. Now, as president, uh, Obama has not really addressed these issues uh, in a direct kind of way, in ways that many of us think not only that he should, but other political leaders around the country need to. But he helped us reimagine what the presidency, presidency should be. Uh, and there's been consequences. There have been a rise in hate groups around the country, according to the FBI, according to the Southern Poverty uh, Law Center, which tracks these, uh, since President Obama was elected. There were three reasons why there's been an increase in uh, hate. One has to do with the economic crisis. Uh, whenever there's an economic crisis, people look for scapegoats, and there's a rise uh, in intolerance. Uh, the immigration issue, in which there's been an attack on uh, people who are perceived as immigrants, particularly immigrants from the developing world. This is really not about immigrants from Canada, right? This is really about immigrants from Mexico, from other parts of Latin America, from Africa, from, uh, from Asia. Uh, but also the election of President Obama. And there's a, a tremendous spike. President Obama gets about 300 death threats a day death threats that the Secret Service has to investigate. This is not just someone saying something stupid on the radio. These are serious death threats through emails, through letters, through other ways, uh, 300 a day. And I would guess, particularly since he's taken on the gun control issue, that might have tripled, right? From what we've heard in the last week or so, uh, the kinds of um, uh, really extreme um, um, messages that we've heard even through kind of mainstream media, let alone going in and digging in on some of the more extremist uh, websites and, and uh, other uh, ways. This is what Colin Powell called the dark vein of intolerance that exists uh, even in mainstream uh, politics. Now, King, I think, and Obama, uh, in terms of thinking long term, uh, their legacy also can help us reimagine not just the nation, uh, but also the world. And King said, again in his speech, the World House, the time has come for all-out world war against poverty. He saw as fundamental to bringing social justice, equality, and inclusion was addressing, and this is back in 1967, uh, King wrote, we have to address the global issues around world poverty. So let me end it there. 
Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I think we have time for a few minutes for a few questions. Question? Yes. No, excellent question. Uh, a couple of things. One is that to a, a significant degree, uh, President Obama has tried to address the issue. I think that the uh, current White House has had a big problem with messaging. For example, the stimulus that was passed in 2009 created more funding for poverty since the war on poverty going back to Lyndon Johnson. Right now, the, the administration, because they were more or less um, frightened by the response to the stimulus, and they allowed the uh, rhetoric on the sp on the stimulus to be dominated by more conservative forces, never really said this is what we've done. But if you really do the research, they actually on issues of attacking homeless uh, funding for homelessness, home funding for a whole range of anti-poverty kinds of uh, concerns, uh, really have done. Uh, as much as they probably could get done, given the structure of power in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's really important to understand, I think, and I think it's, uh, President Obama certainly can say more, uh, but he's really limited by what he can get through Congress. And this has been a Congress that said we're not funding anything uh, if we can, don't have to do it. So. We'll see what happens in the second term. Obama has said he's turning his campaign organization basically into a movement organization. And I think they now understand what's required is not just kind of dealing in the back rooms and sitting down and trying to negotiate, but you have to build a mass movement out there that brings pressure that can bring changes uh, in Congress, and Congress will support some of these issues. Certainly, I think President Obama has to speak out on these issues more, but that's not going to happen unless, as he says, this arc is pushed and this bent towards these kinds of issues, and then that puts a lot of the pressure, I think, on, on those of us who want these social justice kind of concerns uh, to be raised. But, uh. Thank you, Thank Dr. Luce. Listen, uh, you may have other questions, and if you do, uh, we have a luncheon at 11.30 in Baird Library uh, every week uh, after Windows, and Dr. Lusain will be there. We'd love to have you come by, get your lunch, come on into Baird Library and uh, talk to him, and we'll go. Usually we run from 11.30 up, push into 1 o'clock. So thank you. Have a great day.